Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back. And today is, what is today? 26th. It's and, Monday. And what day? It's Monday? It is. This is confusing. We are coming up on <laughs> week four, I think. Week four in the road? About three and a half, somewhere in there. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're starting to look at two, aren't we? <laughs> well, you haven't shaved yet today, so <laughs> it's all right. It's one of those trips. And we are passing through, we, I, I know this we're someplace in Oregon. McMinnville, Oregon. Right. Uh, which is kind of in the northwestern area towards the uh, western coast. And we're going to go to an aviation museum today, which should be interesting for a little bit. Then we're going to head towards the coast and drive uh, towards the Redwoods, but we'll we'll make it a little bit more than halfway there today. Where's the destination city for those who are following along or want to meet us there? Bandon, I believe. Bandon? Oregon, Oregon, which is on the coast. Okay, good. Yeah, and we're going to be taking pictures and whatnot on Instagram. And if you guys want to follow us on our sojourn here, uh, it's certainly more than a trip, more than yes. a vacation. It's a sojourn. Indeed. And we spent some really great time in the Bellevue, Washington area. Mm-hmm. That's uh, right before we came here and visited with some really wonderful uh, family that we know from Puerto Rico, actually, yep. uh, which is kind of interesting that uh, seeing her was maybe 10 minutes away from my uh, longtime childhood friend that also lives in Bellevue, like literally almost the same neighborhood, I would say. And down the street from them, uh, apparently lives Bill Gates. Yeah. So that was kind of an interesting thing. palatial, ridiculous sort of estate meets yeah. small country. It's amazing. Yeah. But what a great place. Bellevue is really beautiful. And we are, so it's worth mentioning, we are at uh, Cindy, Cindy's, uh, go ahead. Engstrom, uh, last name is Engstrom. Eric Engstrom's uh, Viking Wake, actually. My friend Cindy's husband uh, passed away fairly suddenly back in December. And of course, that was during COVID, and and they did do a really lovely video presentation. But you know, it's not the same. And he was very um, influential in lots of different things. Xbox being one of them, and has lots of Microsoft friends. Of course, Microsoft is based here, and it was an interesting group of people. And I thought it was really a lovely celebration of his life. It was, and, and I was really happy and blessed that we were able to share that with her. And it was fun, you and I being so far out of place, considering the fact that it was wall to wall. And the guys, these are OG Microsoft and police or Microsoft executives from the '90s. A couple of which I sort of recognize their names. Yeah. But these guys uh, were all, and some gals too, obviously, were all just absolute heavy hitters, and we're celebrating Eric's life. And like Julie said, I think it was him and two other guys basically uh, started the Xbox. It's kind of sort of a off the books project. Yes. And, and a the, whole bunch of other stuff, but I think that's what he's most known for. Right. Because Microsoft prior to the Xbox had nothing to do with gaming, really. They're yeah. just basically corporate software type things, mm-hmm. kind of like the direction Dell's gone mm-hmm. with computers. But in any event, it was a fascinating experience. And the house that we were at was magnificent. Stunning. That was ridiculous. I mean, it was a, I don't know how to describe it. It was beautiful, obviously, but it was um, mm-hmm. on the water and it was in uh, Bellevue, as Julie said, and off in the distance. Not that far was downtown Seattle. The whole thing was just stunning. The whole experience was exceptional, but really the beautiful part was at the end when they were um, celebrating his life, they gave everyone these uh, butterflies. Yeah, these little, they looked like uh, triangular envelopes and Mm -hmm. it had a nice saying about Eric on there. And when you open up, these were flat envelopes, you open them up and there was a just about waking up folded, um, you know, monarch. Yep. Or, you know, something like a monarch. And when you opened them up and the sun hit their wings, they woke up. And within maybe 30 seconds or so, they would fly off. And it was great because the um, house had just an amazing garden and the butterflies took right to it. And it, it was just a really lovely celebration of life. So if any of you guys are maybe getting married or have something like this, I think that was an, just a fantastic touch. And just an interesting side note, evidently uh, it was difficult. They got these uh, butterflies from Canada. Yeah. And evidently COVID, for some crazy reason in Canada, made yeah. it almost imp- impossible, don't go too far, made it almost impossible for them to import these uh, butterflies, which was, I think, I they don't They had even... to get them from Portland. 
yeah. instead of picking them up in Seattle now, Seattle. now, what butterflies have to do with COVID, I have no idea. I have no idea. But just another part of the COVID legend of weirdness that happened as a result <laughs> of the pandemic. Yeah, and they ship these guys on, on, uh, on ice, basically. Yeah, they keep so, them dormant. So they're in a dormant state. And like Julie said, when they open up the envelopes and you just hold the envelope and the sun... Uh, hits their wings, they just say free, and they yeah, get the heck out of there. It was amazing. It was amazing. But in any event, those are our trip. That's our trip, and uh, we're going to continue. We are obviously headed down the coast. We're going to go into California. We're going to spend some time in the Redwoods. We're going to spend some time in San Francisco. We'll see how much time in San Francisco we spend. We're going to spend then time in Monterey. We're going to go to the Monterey Aquarium because Miss Zoe's never been to a real aquarium before. We're going to go to the, all the car mm-hmm. stuff in Carmel Monterey Car sea. Week. We're going to go Carmel by the Sea. We're going to go to Point Lobos, the national park there. Big Sur. Big Sur. Well, we'll see. Where did you determine that the U.S.? The, the, yeah, we the, have to see what the deal is with that bridge. One. No, it wasn't uh, the bridge. Uh, it was a road. I saw a US picture. One. So those of you in Southern California or Central California, rather, let us know uh, what part of U.S. 1 is closed so we can plan accordingly. Um, we've been looking online, but it's kind of confusing. What's the big bridge called? Do you Bixby. remember? Bixby B-I-X-B-Y. Bridge. Is it be- if you're coming from the north, is it south of Bixby? I think it is. Or is it north of Bixby? Could you guys let us know? And also, we need a fire report because I all I saw was a headline is that two big uh, California wildfires have now joined together to threaten different places. So I haven't looked that up yet because right. we're still in Oregon. That's right. <laughs> well, so and again, we're going to be spending a week. We're staying in Carmel by the sea. Uh, uh, doing a VRBO there. And uh, if any of you are car people, certainly you do not want to miss Car Week. It is, I think, probably the most... uh, Car Week is an understatement. It's it's more like... It's it's a weak name. Car show, rally, auctions. I don't don't even know what they really should call it. It's equivalent to a Catholic's going to the Vatican. Yes, that's the best way to put it. (laughs) Yeah, there's car auctions going on. There's just all kinds of different things. If you're a, a car enthusiast, you already know about it. But if you're anywhere around California and we're going to be going to, we have some friends that are flying in from Puerto Rico and some other parts of the country and we're going to be hanging out with them, but we'd love to have you guys meet with us maybe at the Italiano or maybe at Pebble Beach or, you know, one of the other places that we're going to be attending. So let us know. We're going to be posting live, obviously, from um, uh, Instagram, by the way, Mm -hmm. and follow us on Instagram at um, Tim and Julie Harris. And also do message us. And uh, if you're going to be in the area, you want to communicate directly with us, just go ahead and do it that way through Instagram. And yeah, so we're going to be talking today. Oh, no, you have an article you wanted to share. A little five minutes worth of okay, stuff. Okay, go for it. Okay, now there's some interesting reporting and some of it is conflicting. You really have to look at what they're reporting on and uh, some kind of uh, interesting headlines. You know, you do have to read into an article to see what they're really talking about, as we often remind you guys. So here's an article from Zero Hedge that says, new home sales crash in June to lowest since April 2020. Well, we have to remember that in April 2020, we were still in the height of the pandemic. So that kind of puts a little bit of uh, color to this. But uh, he goes on to say, after existing home sales printed a very modest rebound, Now, that disagrees with his own headline, but after existing home sales printed a modest rebound from lowered numbers, analysts expect new home sales to rebound from a 12-month low in June, even as home builder confidence sinks to an 11th-month low. Um, Now, here's the thing. I went over to check some facts at our very own NAR, who reports slightly different. You really, again, have to look at the wording. Existing home sales rose 1.4%. Remember, he said a modest gain. Home sales rose 1.4%. And also remember, he's comparing it to April of 2020. Well, let's see. I don't remember what was happening in <laughs> April. <laughs> Not a whole lot. Of 2020. Oh, I remember. Yeah, that was about the worst of it, actually. That was the worst of it. That was where everyone thought they were going to be living in caves and, you know, basically yes. the zombie apocalypse was there. It was the very start of the pandemic and the world didn't know what the hell it was going to do. So it does make sense that back in that era, there was, or in that month, in those really 90 day period, that new construction did come to a halt because builders didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Makes total and complete sense. But the reason that and you don't have to get too much more into the weeds well, on this article. The, the well, main thing is that inventory rose. But the, OK, so we'll, we'll read that. But the gist of this article is I want you guys to pay attention to how much this, uh, this article and this information is hyped and is being spun because there are people out there that benefit from your belief that the housing market are, is going to crash, especially as real estate agents, because the people that are going to start and you guys watch them, they all come out of the woodwork. There's going to be people that are going to start trying to sell you on the idea the housing market's going to crash and they're going to try to start selling you information about you know, distressed real estate and all the rest of it. And let's be clear, Julie and I are absolutely, uh, when the market did legitimately crash back in 07, 08, 09, we were selling short sale REO information. 
we were letting you guys know how to do loan mods. We were letting you guys know how to uh, survive and thrive in that market. But that's not the market that we're in. It's not the market that's going to come. And if it were, we would certainly tell you. But there will be people that come out of the woodwork trying to convince you that the market, the wheels are going to come off the wagon because they're trying to sell you some exclusive way to get on REO uh, company lists and all this other malarkey. And a uh, fact for you guys to back that up is that currently less than 2%, I think it's actually less than 1.5% of closings are actually uh, distressed. And I had a really good conversation with someone the other day, a very good friend of mine who I respect, and he was convinced, uh, JK, yes, I'm talking about you, he was convinced that basically there was going to be like 1.4 million foreclosures and all this, and he hadn't done the research to find out the countervailing truth, and his uh, premise was all these loan mods are going to go into default, and I don't want to talk about that on today's no, show. No, we've covered but, that in previous shows. Yeah, we've talked about this in previous shows, but the gist of it is is that none of it's going to happen, and if you guys really want the big overarching reason why there's not going to be a bunch of foreclosures, I'll, here it is. There's two reasons why. This, If you want to interpret, especially what Julie's about to say, as any sort of... Um, you know, I would call it negative housing news, which I don't. But if you wanted to, that's a benefit if you believe that low interest rates are going to conti uh, should continue in order to keep the housing market hot. And the Fed will probably most likely use this information as reasons to not raise interest rates yes. anytime in the foreseeable future with regards to real estate. Okay, good. That's great, that's right? Good. I mean, so if you are in a belief that bad news is good, which if you know some of you do believe that the bad news about the housing market is good news for interest rates, well, this should be good news for you. So just be you know be thinking. You have to use your own brain and don't expect yeah. so uh, you know the so-called media to be interpreting information that's in your best interest because nine times out of ten they have an agenda. Yeah, they do not have your back. Um, so then this is one of the reasons why I go to NAR to check my facts. Uh, the thing well, that but Julie, th truthfully, NAR has a bias too. They do, but they I like their statistics. I mean, sure, at least sure. they're giving me good graphs and yeah. stuff. Um, so here's the thing that will affect you immediately. The inventory of unsold homes increased, not a huge increase, but 3.3% to 1.25 million from May to June. That's an equivalent of 2.6 and 2 months of monthly sales pace or a uh, 2.6 month supply. So that's good. Days on the market are stretching out a little bit. Mm -hmm. The competition uh, is getting a little bit lighter and prices are still rising. Median existing home sale prices uh, rose year over year of 23.4%, second highest level recorded since January of 99. Um, and again, average days in the market is about 17. So that's that's the stuff that really affects them. So computer being closed. Now what we're going to talk about, again, if you guys want more information on why there's not going to be a housing crash, go back and listen to our past podcasts. Um, we've had probably 15 million, maybe even close to 20 million downloads of this podcast. It's the number one listened to daily podcast in at least the United States. Um, and we always are usually ahead of the information curve by 60 to 90 days with regards to things you guys need to know about to make sure that you're preparing your business and your personal life for what's coming next in housing. We'll always have your backs. We always have your backs. And what we're going to do, and Julie and I do this intentionally, well, just understand we don't have a bias uh, pro-housing boom or you know, pro-housing bust. Mm -hmm. We really don't care because the reality of it is, is agents that are smart and educated and ambitious can make money no matter what direction the market's going. So it doesn't really matter. Honestly, for the sake of real estate sales, it doesn't really matter. Agents can no. make money no matter what direction the market's going. Unfortunately, what generally happens is as the market shifts, the agents that were making money in one market aren't the ones that make the money in the next market because they don't they don't uh, you know pivot fast enough. They don't adapt fast enough. They they essentially will allow themselves to die in the vine while a new breed of agents sort of enters into the equation, and that's great too. So look, guys, we don't have any bias one way or the other. We just want you to be informed. And once we have a stance on something or once we're relatively certain that something's going to happen, we are going to go out of our way to over-prepare you. You listen or you don't listen. It's your decision. That is truly the bottom well line. Well put. That's right. Yeah. So look, uh, we did a very, very popular, and I think it's going to become something of a iconic, if I dare I say, interview with Glenn Sanford on his yacht the other day. Yes. And um, I, Julie and I have talked about it. Uh, pro I mean, obviously, we drove for six hours yesterday, so we had lots of time to talk about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was fascinating. I have to say what was um, and what we're going to talk about today 
are Julie was listening to the interview. I was doing the interview. She was just an earshot away. So what we're going to talk about is what we learned overtly and sort of covertly. Yes. And some of the conversations that happened during the interview that were interesting and some of the conversations that happened after the interview over lunch, which I thought were equally as interesting. Yes. So this is kind of our take on the interview, if you will. And if you missed that interview, it's not too late. Get caught up. Right. It's uh, maybe posted two days ago, maybe three Friday, days ago. I think. Somewhere like that. So it's, but, not, it's not too far back in the series. Let me start out by saying this. Mm -hmm. I think that um, one of my initial uh, takeaways from talking to Glenn Sanford it was that he is exactly the person that I'd hoped he'd be, truthfully. Ah, what do you that, mean by that? Um, that he was a totally and completely unpretentious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was something. I was, yes, I would agree with that. Yes, yeah, all, sure. I mean, I've, I'm laughing because I'm thinking back to all the other, you know, iconic uh, real estate people that you and I have been associated with from you know, top producing <laughs> agents and teams, not to mention some of these guys that run these, that founded these big brokerages, right? Sure. I mean, you can't say that about any of them. They always have this no. little air of, you know, pretension. Maybe, yeah, there's a little show going on. A little show, exactly. Yeah. And I like the fact that Glenn was very um, humble. I mean, he really was. Mm -hmm. He was very humble. He was very soft-spoken. Yeah. Um, he was very considerate about what he said. Now, some of the things were just sort of like, you know, uh, obviously some of the conversation topics he was very prepared for because he's talked about it a million times before. Mm -hmm. I tried to avoid those questions truthfully. Cause yes, you did. You didn't want it to be like a standard issue, predictable type interview. Yeah. You know, where did the EXP come from? Where, where, yeah, exactly. Where's the name come from? I mean, we're not asking any dumb questions like that. I mean, they're not dumb, but I mean, They've you been know, done. They've been done. You know, Julie and I listened to probably three or four interviews with him prior to our interview, and we wanted to avoid all questions that we heard frequently asked because it is interesting. Um, and Glenn talks about this in the interview. You guys really should listen. How, in essence, 2007, 2008, 2009 were not nice to him in terms no. of the housing market. He was suffering just like a lot of agents were. And that was the thing that ultimately fueled his um, initiative to create EXP. Well, you might say that maybe this is too extreme, but you might say that EXP was kind of the phoenix from the flames of 2007, 8, and 9. That's exactly what I was thinking. And, you know, not all of our listeners can relate to that, but they certainly can <laughs> look it up historically. And, and we certainly lived through that as a coaching company, as well as uh, podcasting through that. But EXP was a result of that. And he talked to you a little bit about that. Well, but do the timing on this, too. Mm -hmm. So he's now in his mid fifties. He's a little bit older than me, mm -hmm. and so he was had this whole life changing thing happen to him about the time he was forty. Yes, and I think that that's really significant because, you know, from our coaching experience and life experience, we know that oftentimes people give up too soon, mm -hmm. and we talk about that a lot on a micro version. Like, you know, okay, we're halfway through the year. Maybe it's not the year you wanted. Don't give up too soon, right? And you know, you can do a hard reset. Well, you can also do a hard reset partway through your life. And maybe you're sitting there and you're 35 right now, or you're 30 and you think, well, gosh, you know, when is it going to take off for me? And I love these inspirational stories. He's certainly one of them. Well, remember Warren Buffett didn't, he made exactly. over 90% of his wealth by the time, you know, after he turned age 60. But specifically what I was referring to when I made mm -hmm. the age comment was, is again, to our coaching experience, mm -hmm. a lot of people actually have some sort of emotional switch that's flipped at a certain age, yes. I've seen that happen certainly with men, mm -hmm. and it's almost always 40. Mm -hmm. But also the thing was, is that the, it goes back to motivation, right? Yes. What motivates you? The carrot or the stick? People love to ask that question, but it's kind of a BS question. Every single modern psychological study that's ever been done by anybody that's credible will tell you the thing that motivates people more than anything is losing what you already have. Mm -hmm. So it's not getting the yacht. You know, we were on this beautiful yacht. That wasn't probably motivating him back then. Um, and, you know, so there wasn't necessarily the carrot. It was the stick of probably losing what he already had. Sure. And I think one of the differences in people that come back from that versus people that make that their theme song right. or their life story, you know, I did great until I lost it all, is that they didn't accept that. He didn't accept that 2007, 8, and 9 was going to be his new reality. He did something about it. He created something significant instead of just accepting it. This goes back to what we were just talking about. A lot of people that are attracted to the negative news and the negative housing about headlines mm -hmm. are the ones that emotionally did not ever come back yes. uh, from you know some previous hardship. Mm -hmm. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to rationalize, in our humble opinion as real estate coaches, 
So take that for what it's worth, but it does seem to make sense. They're trying to rationalize never actually committing to the accomplishment of a specific goal because in their minds they're saying, subconsciously perhaps, why should I actually double down on today if I believe tomorrow is going to be a shit show? That's right. It's almost like a negative confirmation bias. Yeah, and they're using it as an excuse. Mm -hmm. And so, but here's the other thing. And I really love the the fact that he talked about this on our podcast, which Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard anyone talk about before, Mm -hmm. is it was a number of years before they actually started getting significant numbers. In yes. terms of agents. It didn't just instantly take off. Right. And he said, he actually said the real, uh, you know, parody point, if you will, is when uh, Gene Frederick uh, became involved with mm-hmm. EXP. And once Gene Frederick became involved, you could see the growth that came from that, from yes. all the people he knew and influenced and people, mm-hmm. he, he was like the good housekeeping seal of approval sure. for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, I think he was the number one, um, I don't know, recruiter at Keller Williams. I don't remember the whole story. Mm-hmm. But when he joined EXP and he joined Glenn, that's when and and then he you know glenn talked about some other people that were also influential in the, the mm-hmm. massive growth of the company but again it, the, it was one of those things like so it was that it was at that point of his life he used that time of hardship to really basically essentially ignite his own rocket ship and then this mm-hmm. is the thing i thought was really fascinating he didn't give up too soon he basically did long periods of, uh, you know, years fr- practically before EXP really mm-hmm. took off. EXP, he, I remember, didn't he said like, I had, had 25 agents and 50 agents for a while mm-hmm. and they were celebrating when they finally got to 100 agents. Sure, yeah. You know, and now it's got 60,000 agents mm-hmm. and based on the monthly net growth, the company's going to have over 100,000 agents mm-hmm. by the end of this year or thereabouts. It's amazing. And then, you know, realistically, the company keeps growing and you're looking at largest real estate company in the history of uh, real estate companies. It's already international. Um, you know, we're in what Italy, Spain, yeah. Israel, Portugal, uh, Australia. Mexico, Australia. I mean, who everywhere, basically. It's astonishing. It really is. And if you, you know, sometimes people can't imagine big numbers and you have to keep it in perspective, right? So I, I want to uh, put some light on that. 100,000 agents is more than the population of most of the towns that you guys live in mm-hmm. listening. And I think, you know, when I think about, okay, well, what is like, say, 3,000 people look like? That's an entire huge auditorium filled with people. That is a really significant growth pattern. But to your point, it didn't just instantly happen that way. He probably had lots of days of doing what he didn't want to do when he didn't want to do it. Obviously, at the highest level, or he wouldn't yep. be getting the results that he's getting. He did, and he, you know, he obviously was able to attract the right leaders in the company, many of which are still at EXP. Mm-hmm. But else, you were just t- touching on something that's fascinating. When you and I've been, you know, we've been doing this trip with Zoe. We're going to end up going to over twenty states by the time we're done with this trip, driving just all over the country. Um, and it's really fun to see the EXP signs. And it does honestly, oh, yes. it does yeah. honestly remind me of when Keller Williams was first getting big in the nineties. Uh, and, and then you and I were finally starting to see Keller Williams. I mean, we weren't involved with Keller Williams beyond basically coaching a ton of Keller Williams agents and doing events for Keller Williams. Julie and I, are, uh, Julie was a Keller Williams agent for like maybe a month. I mean, that was the extent of it. We were with Remax our whole careers, basically. Um, and I, you know, Remax was the same way. But when you mm-hmm. travel and, but now you're starting to see it. Would I, I guess what I'm trying to say is there was a question we asked him. Let me find that question. Here it is. Read that question. In business school, we learned about the uh, something called the stages of product maturity, which is how a new product or a model actually evolves. And there's four stages. These are kind of self-explanatory. The first one is innovators. Then you have early adopters. Then you have an early majority and then a late majority. And your question was to Glenn, where do you think EXP is in the stages of development? And we had a fun conversation around that because it definitely is out of the innovation stage. The innovation mm-hmm. stage was the hard years where, yes. you know, is this going to work? And let's, and, you know, people were joining, were sort of true believer types. But for the most part, you know, they were probably, you know, well, this, this is an interesting idea. Is it, is it too soon? Is it, who knows? And that, that's the innovation stage. And I would venture a guess that when uh, uh, Gene joined, that's when really the early adapters really started to pile on. He was probably early in the early adopters and uh, pattern. Julie researched this, so we got all this stuff factually correct because it's been a long time since we were in business school. But when you look at this, it's a bell curve, basically. And the early adapter and the early uh, majority stage, those goes those can go on for decades, basically. But the early adopters phase is where the company is. And so if you think of the early adopters phase, it's in the beginning part or maybe, maybe 30% of the early adopters phase. Mm-hmm. And here's how we know this for a fact is that when we're driving around the country, there's some areas we go to where it's, you know, Julie will fire up the 
realtor.com or whatnot, and we'll see lots and lots of listings by eXp agents. And then you go to other markets and there's nothing. And that is exciting because, again, going back to my example about Keller Williams, I remember when that was the same way. When people were like Keller Who, and they no one knew who it was, and there's a country music band and all right. that, yeah. you know, and uh, and now it's basically it, even if you go to the most rural area of the United States, chances are they've heard of that brand. Mm -hmm. Well, EXP is going to get there, and if you to be uh, thinking that you're too late to be involved with EXP is crazy, because the market is just well, coming around, just beginning to sort of kind of come around to mass acceptance, and that when mass acceptance happens, that's when you start seeing. So as soon as you get into the early adopter phase, as I do remember this from business school. The, adapta the adaptation of the new technology or what have you, that's when things really start to take off. Sales increase, people start, you know, because the early adopters are often the ones that lead other people to make purchasing decisions. Oh, I see Bob bought this new iPhone. That thing must be cool. Bob's usually pretty spot on with the things he's tuned into. I'm going to go buy an iPhone too. And then you get into the next phase, which is early majority. But again, guys, we're years away from early majority. So if you're in a town where there's not a lot of VXP agents, good. That's get a good thing. That's that's why you asked the question was how much growth is there left in EXP? Right. Because sometimes you, you have people, again, to our, our beginning theme here is they think, well, you know, that ship has sailed. It's too late. But in fact, it's just getting started in spite of the, you know, huge trajectory of growth that's already been experienced we still have a huge amount of runway left. Yeah. And, it's and that's ex exciting. It's exciting for EXP. It's exciting for our mm -hmm. coaching company. It's yeah. exciting for us personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And it, it's mm -hmm. so much fun to be involved in this company with all these, you know, very excited entrepreneur pe entrepreneurial people. Yeah. Huge enthusiasm. Yeah. And it's, it, I have to say also, um, and maybe it's just our, our group at EXP, but it's mm -hmm. interesting for me to see people who are, coming like we got this in our coaching company right mm -hmm. we get testimonials from people where they're saying to us well this is what i've been looking for i've been up and down the mountain before i've been with other coaching companies before i've been doing things that other people told me would work and they didn't work and then i discovered you guys and now guess what when i get to work everything works yeah. and I, in that kind of um i think um that sort of emotional re response to a product we'd only or a service we'd only been uh, on the side of from having provided it, but now being associated with EXP where people are equally as excited mm -hmm. is motivational for me. It definitely is. It is. And it's so cool to be able to bring mm -hmm. people to both coaching and to EXP because they work hand in hand. Definitely. We're going to teach you how to sell real estate in high volume. EXP is going to obviously be your broker to provide the legal support and you know all the rest of the community support, the cultural support. But they're also going to provide financial support if you take advantage of the stock awards and you take advantage of the revenue share and the other things we talked about. So what other questions did you hear us uh, talk about that see. you thought were in particularly interesting? Did you ask him what were three surprising things that happened about you? No. Talk, you had an interesting thing talk about actually being a billionaire. Oh yeah, and I think that uh, how people think it is and how it actually is might be different as a result of that conversation. Did you want to touch on that? Well, um, I mean, he's a billionaire, right? Yeah. And he made himself a billionaire in less than what fourteen years, something like yeah, that. Yeah, less than a decade and a half. That's you, amazing. You could even argue it was less than that because he made EXP. EXP didn't go public. I, mm, into, that's true. Yeah, probably he less did. Than a he did say this. I, was it on mic or off mic? I don't know. I don't know. It's either. up to you what you want to share. Well, I mean, he <laughs> he said to him. He said when he. I think it was when the company went public and he had mm -hmm. a net worth of 100 million. Mm -hmm. He said, then he figured that at that point he was set for life. Mm -hmm. And you could tell that, and I, you know, that's, we can understand what he means by that. Mm -hmm. Because once you have money, it's no longer a consideration or concern. Once basically you have enough abundance on the financial side of the, the ledger that you could start allowing your the energies that went to thinking about money to be used in other things, you really do are set free. And that, that really goes back to the theme of our revenue share group at, at EXP, which Libertas. is called which is called Libertas, which means freedom. You know, it also means liberty, but it means freedom in Latin. And that was the motivation ultimately because – you know, when Julie and I stand in front of big groups of people, we're going to be doing some big live events next year, it looks like. And when we're standing in front of big groups of people, we ask people why they got into real estate. And the answers are? Freedom. Well, ultimately, ultimately. they get to freedom. But they'll, some people will say, I wanted to pay for a trip to Disneyland or I wanted to buy a new oh, the couch. the initial goals, yeah. Right. The initial, so the initial reasons they got, I didn't, want to have a, I didn't want to have a boss. I wanted to essentially... Freedom of time. For, yeah, exactly. So they never... Some people have not really put words to the emotional feeling that they wanted to have from being their own boss and getting a real estate mm -hmm. license and being an entrepreneur. And the real thing that everyone's trying to strive for is to be free. And so define that. And I'm asking all of you guys to define that as well. What does that mean? Does it mean that you are going to have a bunch of you know listings? Is that freedom to you? It might be. That's a level of freedom, certainly. 
chances are freedom is not having a bunch of buyers that you're beholden to 24 seven. That's nothing to do with freedom. <laughs> that's definitely not that's the exact opposite, opposite right? <laughs> but if you really get to it, isn't it ultimately what you want is to make it so that will you give yourselves permission listeners ultimately is the question to be financially free? Will you allow yourself that gift? We seriously, and, and I've, I've come to the conclusion that some of you, and I'm, I'm sure this is true. Some of you never will because you can't relate to you not having the financial burden, you not having that monkey on your back, the struggle. You, your personality is the struggle. Who you identify yourself is, as is the struggle. And that's going to be the reason that many of you aren't ever going to create any sort of real true financial abundance because you've not disassociated the struggle with who the person is that you could be. And I think ultimately that's the reason if you really cut through it, because you can't say nowadays it's lack of knowledge or lack of information. If you want to seek something, if you want knowledge on how to do something, you can find it. You can buy it. You can find a mentor. You can do it. There's nothing you can't get access to. Maybe you don't have the intellectual acumen for it. Maybe you don't have the physical acumen for it. Who cares? Point being is there's no limit to what you can learn nowadays. So knowing that you can learn how to be financially free, that's what we teach you how to do ultimately. It's our goal in our coaching program. Um, and yet you still don't do it. Why? Well, they could go to whylibertas.com and maybe <laughs> right. find that out a little well, bit. Go, you, know, you guys, look, the, the bottom line is you've got to ask yourself if you have access to this you know, encyclopedia of information that's going to make it so you're financially free and you not even refuse, you, you, you refuse to pull a book off the shelf, but you don't even want to walk into the room. You know what the room is full of. The book, the room says, the sign above the door says, room where you learn how to be financially free and you don't even want to walk in there. Why? I mean, you got to ask yourself why. Oh, I'm a skeptic. Those books are all bullshit. Okay, well, there you go. So your skepticism is something you'd rather have than being financially free. You know, you go through all this and look, guys, I get it, especially, you know, when Julie and I've reconnected with many of you as we go on this trip, you know, physically, emotionally, or just digitally through you guys giving us suggestions through Instagram. We go through these little towns and I get it because Julie and I are from a relatively little town too. You know, we're high school sweethearts for God's sake. We've been married for 30 years this year. When we're driving around these little towns, I remember what it's like to be in those little towns and knowing that if you decide to be the crab that gets out of the bucket, you know, you put a bunch of crabs in the bucket, one tries to get out, the others will pull it back in. When you try to, and you're in a little town and you all of a sudden start, and we were just visiting with Lance, Lance and Karen Kenmore. Yes. And Kenny, Kennewick, Washington. And they clearly are the ones that are getting out of the bucket. Yes. Beautiful building, beautiful everything. And they do travel a ton because they're mm -hmm. always getting themselves exposure to people that think bigger. That's right. But if you're not doing it like Lance and Karen are, and you're just stuck in the small town being surrounded by other people that want you to essentially stay the same, who the common theme is that, you know, when you go out to the restaurant or you're hanging out with friends and family, it's the struggle. That's what bonds everyone. One is the struggle, the financial struggle. Did you see property taxes, gas prices went up? If that's the thing that bonds you and all of a sudden you don't have that as part of your life anymore because you decided not to, you decide to do the different, take a different path financially, you will alienate those people. And I think subconsciously, that's what you're fearful. You're fearful of losing those relationships with people. And guys, and I'm not going to lie to you, okay? I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That, that does happen. A lot of those people will start to reject you as you start to ascend. And I'm sure Glenn experienced this too. I mean, Julie and I experienced it as well, and many, as you, many of you will as well. But I'll tell you what's going to happen on the other end of that or on your ascension. The people that were in that small town or in your family or in your brokerage or in your community that also had the inkling to get the hell out of that crab bucket, they're going to follow you. They're going to use, you're going to be their leader to go to the next level. Um, and then some people who stay in the bucket, you know, they might stay in the bucket for 10 years. You know, Julie and I, you know, when we started selling a lot of real estate and became very successful in our careers, selling books and just doing all this other stuff, nobody expected us to do what we did with our lives and what we continue to do with our lives. And other people from our communities, they started, they were paying attention all these years. And they, in some ways, and some of them sometimes overtly will tell us, people we grew up with, will say, you know, I saw you and Julie do it. And, you know, maybe it took me 10 or 15 years after you guys started to hit it out of the park in your early 20s. But now I'm really starting to succeed. Or they'll sometimes ask us how to get real estate licenses well, and things like we, that. You lead by example. That, yeah, that's, that's how you point. reconcile those feelings of maybe they're not going to come with me. Maybe they will. You be the best you in business and in life that you can be. Set the example. And everybody else sorts themselves out. You got to do it because you know it's inside of you. And if you don't allow what's the best version of you to manifest in this lifetime, I mean, from when I last time I checked, you only live once and you're dead a real long time. So the question you got to ask yourself is, what the hell are you waiting for? And I would venture a guess mm -hmm. 
that uh, Glenn Sanford, though that would have been a great question, mm-hmm. back in 2007, 8, and 9, right. he basically had, again, not maybe in that exact way, that exact epiphany. You only live once and you're dead a real long time. Why don't I hit the side of the park? And he did. He did, he clearly. Did. He's a billionaire. And still is. He's one of the 2,000 wealthiest people on planet Earth. You know, and he's going to continue to ascend. And if you guys are studying EXPI stock, EXP stock is uh, something that it's very, very rare that you don't read some stock analyst who uh, isn't saying, buy the damn stock. Well, you we know? did a whole podcast, a series of podcasts about that last week. We did. And Julie and I are not stock pickers, stock analysis, stock professionals, and don't take our advice. We're just your friendly real estate coaches, but we do have a lot of VXPI stock and we'll be buying That's more. That's right. And other people who are stock analysts have said that this is hitting it out of the park. Yeah. So who do do that for a living. Look, if you, I say this and it is kind of trite, but it is true. If you've ever wondered what it feels like to be in the right place at the right time, this is what it feels like. Now, you got to ask yourself why the heck you aren't doing something with this information. Julie and I think that we've put together what will be the exact perfect recipe and roadmap for you to move forward in your business. Between our coaching program and joining Julie and I at eXp Realty, we'll teach you how to sell real estate in abundance, how to run a very profitable business, and eXp is going to provide the perfect infrastructure for you to basically scale up not just your business, uh, but frankly, your family's future, your legacy. Now, this isn't going to appeal to all of you, and this, I get it, and some of you aren't ready for this. Some of you are just like, I like it when you guys uh, talk about anything other than eXp. I know some of you feel that way. But still, at least be curious about it. At least have your mind open to it. Check out the website we created, which explains what we're offering at eXp. It's called whylibertas.com. Do you remember the code? 47372. Oh, you show off. Or just text EXP to 47372. Just text EXP to 47372. Guys, join us in this journey. We're asking you, offering an at, you know, frankly, uh, we want to, we're, (laughs) what's the word? Uh, asking to be considered to be your sponsor at eXp. And for that, check out what we're going to do to um, make it so that it's a no-brainer decision for you. Just go to whylibertas.com, whylibertas.com. So do you want to say anything else? I hope to meet the rest of you on our trip. Yeah. So So Zoe Zoe Grace has been sitting uh, here the whole, well, laying here the whole time. Very patient. Glaring at us in this (laughs) too small of a hotel room. Uh, compared to the last hotel, which was a ridiculous suite. I know. We are Sorry. moving on up in that one. That was awesome. 20th yeah. floor. The 20th floor. And in Bellevue. You, yeah, it was amazing. Uh, we did a video of that with Zoe uh, being, up, what, was that the highest building you've ever been in, right, Zoe? I think so. Yeah, so here's Zoe Grace. She's been very patient with us. Now we got to get back on the road. But Zoe, here's the bad news. We have to sit in the car for how many hours? Four to five, I'd say. Four to five hours before we get to the Redwoods. But the good news is your iPad's waiting in the museum. That's right. That's right. We're going to go to the museum first. Yeah. So that should be an adventure. <laughs> but do reach out to us. We'd love to see you guys maybe grab some coffee or something of that nature. And anything else that we should know between, say, Northern Oregon and uh, Northern California, um, you know, just let us know on that as well. Mudslides, mass fires, riots, <laughs> looting. Oh, and by the way, uh, well, I wish I tacked this on at the end. It's kind of inappropriate, but who cares? What? The, what did we go through yesterday or in Oregon? What was the town? Uh, which one what was the city about? that we oh, Portland? Through? Okay, it was Portland, yeah. right? So, driving through Portland, Oregon, I have to say, was such a ridiculous contrast Very to, big to contrast. Bellevue, Washington. And it was how many hours away was that? Three or four? Like maybe three tops. It was yeah. incredible. Yeah, major league differences. You guys have listened. It just you, I hope all of you have this experience because Julie and I have traveled before in our lives in the country, but never before had there been this big a contrast. Not just, well, we got to Portland, there was graffiti everywhere. There was people living underneath tent the cities. overpasses, tent cities. And we were mostly on the you know, on five, you know, the whole time. Yeah, that's and not out wandering it was, around. It was kind of shocking. But I'll say really the other shocking. thing is kind of funny too, is how the hairstyles, I mentioned this the other or day and it's lack so funny. thereof. <laughs> Did you notice the hairstyles in Portland? The dudes all had like, what, what are those called? Modified Back- mullets? Well, yeah, modified mullets with hair bun. Or with, with the, yeah, man what, buns. What's this? With man buns, yeah. They were modified odd. mullets with man buns. Yeah. And it was like with some interesting shaving going on. Yeah. And like the first time. An odd I, look. And lots of tattoos. Oh, yes. The, the tattoo count went way up. But you know what they looked like? Hmm. I mean, think about this. They think they're being unique and they are certainly. I thought a little Mad Max maybe. But. No, they look like old school samurai. I mean, think about yes, that. The sam- samurai were covered with tattoos. Yeah. They they rocked the you know samurai man mm-hmm. bun. They sometimes had long hair. You yeah. know, a little bit of the mullet situation. But it's, I just thought it was funny. I was thinking about that afterwards. Where have I seen that look before? <laughs> oh yeah, samurai. 
you Very know. Very unusual. But yeah. it is funny too, and I and it's like uh, the contrast now between cities and even like when we were in Bellevue, yeah. And we crossed the I forget the main drag there. There was one part of Bellevue where it was very like you didn't see a lot of political stuff everything was you know sort of nice and orderly and then as soon as you crossed over this one street which i don't remember things immediately started to feel different Mm -hmm. so the it's fascinating for us from a (laughs) a human perspective anthropologically exactly to see all the differences in the country right now and it is real that's for sure but here's the thing does not matter what side of the political fence one leans they still have to buy or sell real estate yes indeed (laughs) so be the that's the reason julie and our big advocates of being apolitical be republicrats or yes. whatever the modern version of saying that is. Yeah. And don't alienate people, you know, because we are more than, we are very comfortable being around anybody of any political leanings and, and or any sort of biases one way or the other. It really doesn't matter to us. And hopefully you guys feel the same way. This is the greatest country on planet Earth. If you don't believe me, get in a car and drive around <laughs> and you'll feel Prove as blessed. Yourself. You'll feel as blessed as we do because the people and the places um, even in some of these cities where they're obviously dealing with a lot of, you know, unease, it is still a magical place Absolutely. to live. And I feel incredibly blessed to be on yeah, this journey too. with you and uh, Rugrat. Yeah, and we're not even halfway done yet. You don't like being called Rugrat? <laughs> All right, Sassafras. It's cut. Sassafras? Is that better? <laughs> you guys have a fantastic day. If you want to text me, do so directly at 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. Do you want to say anything, Zoe? Bye-bye. There you go. (laughs) Bye-bye. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.